So, after having finished with uh, the mission of reading the approximately, I think it's 319 poems of 300 Tang poems of the anthology, in this version that I have uh, read by uh, Geoffrey Waters, Michael Farman and David Lunder, question is, should we go any further? Now, all anthologies are by their, by their very nature limited, and uh, the number of poetry that has survived from the Tang is pretty substantial. I'm not sure how many poems there is in the Chuan Tang Shi, which is the, the collection of all extant Tang Dynasty poems, but it's tens of thousands, I believe. I'll, I'll check somewhere later on. And of course, those poems are only uh, a brief sample of the actual poems that were composed during the Tang Dynasty. That is, many more were written than have been preserved. We've also talked that uh, uh, the ah, here I have it. Forty nine thousand poems are preserved in the Chuang Tangshi, which is quite a lot, a lot more than three hundred and nineteen. Uh, we also talked uh, about the fact that uh, this anthology is pretty Catholic. I mean, uh, I think it's pretty representative in both the poets it includes and in the proportions of the poems for each poet that is included in the anthology. So, generally speaking, I think it's a, a, a very, very good representative sample of Tang poetry with human limitations that are unavoidable in any anthological project. Still, I did find a few omission, a few omissions that I think would deserve some correcting, yeah, even though such an act might sound presumptuous in a person who doesn't know classical Chinese and only reads translations. But anyway, uh, however, however daring or, or <laughs> irresponsible this project is, I have decided to expand this video series with approximately, I would say, no more than 60 perhaps poems to complement for the small, I wouldn't call them mistakes, but for the absences or incompletedness of some of the selections in this anthology. Uh, let me explain a little bit uh, how I decided, or how I started deciding which poets I would include. So first of all, I, I made a comparison between 300 Tang poems and another uh, anthology. It's called The Poems from the Masters. The Qian Jia Shi. Now, this anthology was a very interesting one. It has been translated a few years ago by Red Pine, and I have it in digital format. It's a very nice anthology. In fact, I read it before reading 300 Tang Poems. And uh, there's an interesting relation that that anthology has with this anthology. The Qian Jia Shi, usually translated Poems from the Masters, is an anthology from the late Southern Song Dynasty. So, picture dates like 1260, uh, 1270, 1280, Anno Domini. And uh, it was a very popular anthology in its day. And it included a wide variety of poems. It wasn't just Tang poets. It also included five dynasties and northern and southern Song dynasty poetry. And as I said, it was very popular. And in fact, one of the reasons why, why the author of 300 Tang Poems decided to make his anthology was as a reaction, as a critical reaction against the previous anthology. So, so Sun Zhu didn't agree with many of the choices made. Probably the first one he didn't agree with was selecting poems from out of the Tang as models, as classics. Uh, but but uh, he also didn't agree probably with many of the choices in the poems and in the proportions of, of the poems, even though there is a significant overlap of poets and even of poems between one and another anthology. So first some numbers to compare. Tang Poems has 319 poems. And Masters has 224. But actually, so, so Masters is smaller, but it's even smaller because out of those 224, a little bit more than half, there's 141 are poems from the Tang Dynasty. So actually the comparison should be 319 versus 141. So as a rule of thumb, you could say that uh, the Qian Jiashi has half of the number of poems that uh, Tang Poems has. So if we move on into authors now, uh, we see we, what we would expect, that based on those proportions of, 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 of masters being half the size of 
of, of Tang poems. We would expect less poets in, uh, in masters, and this is fulfilled, but the, the difference is pretty small. So Tang poems are 76 poets, uh, masters are 68. So how can this very small difference be explained? Well, basically, as we will comment later, uh, I think the issue is that uh, masters includes more one poem poets and uh, and uh, town poems devote especially to the important poets uh, uh, quite a big number of poems so i don't have the exact numbers right now with me here but like uh, the first poem in masters which is obviously dufu has let's say 20 something poems to his name the second best represented poet li bai has only nine and the third best represented poet, which must be one way, must have five or six. So almost all of the poets in Masters have only one poem to their name. And even the big ones don't have more than three, four, five, with the exception of Du Fu. On the contrary, in, in Tang poems, the big poets have many poems, like uh, Du Fu has almost 40, or, or a bit more than 40, I don't remember. Li Bai has 30-something. Uh, one way must have 29, 30, so, so it's not the same. Uh, another thing, uh, moving on to another point. Uh, so out of those 76 poets in, in, in poems and 68 poets, Tang poets in masters, uh, 41 are shared in common between both of them, so the majority. But also there are authors that appear in both cases in one anthology but not in the other which, again, we would expect uh, a priori this to be especially typical of, of, of poems because it's bigger, but it also happens in masters, and again in very high numbers, related to what we have just mentioned, the greater spread. So uh, there's 27 poems in masters that do not appear in poems, and there are 35 poems, poets in poems that do not appear in masters, so quite, an, quite a significant amount. So... Uh, comparing which people are absent from each collection, uh, important poets that are not in masters are, for example, Liu Changqing, Liu Zongyuang, Wen Tingyung, Yuan Chen, Lu Lung, and Zhang Yulin. Mm, I wouldn't be able to explain most of those absences. I imagine Liu Changqing's is based on the fact that although he is a high tang poet and an important one, he really f he feels like, uh, how could I say it? Um, he is a, a, a very proficient second-rate poet of the, glow, of the most glorious period of Chinese literature. So, so he's a good poet, but he has the relative misfortune of writing poems in the high tang when he is competing with, with Li Bai, with Du Fu, with Wang Wei, with Wang Changling, you know, with, with, with enormous giants in, in poetry. So even though he's a good poet, compared to them, he is pretty <laughs> insignificant. And also his style is generally taken to be very representative of the high tang style, but in a, in a bit of a bland and indistinct way. So probably that explains why he doesn't appear in the Masters. Liu Zongyuang's case, well, he's mostly a prose writer, even though he has some famous poems. Wen Tingjun basically excelled in the Zhu, which is another meter, not the Shi. And uh, the other ones, Yuan Chen, Lu Lu, Zhang Juling, they're relatively important poets, but yeah, not, not, not first-rate poets. In any case, perhaps with the exception of Yuan Chen, I don't know. On the other hand, uh, poets that do appear in Masters but don't appear in Tang poems and that perhaps should, basically three, uh, at least from the little I know of Tang poetry, Chang Jue should have been there probably. He's an important, he's a bit like Zhang Yuling for the early High Tang period, an important politician who, who was a good patron of, of poets and uh, he probably should be there. Perhaps I mean, it's disputable. Chu Guangxi, he definitely should be here, there. He's a silver poet, but uh, I think there is a, a, a critical consensus that he is important, and we will see that when we see anthologies in a minute. Wang Ji, uh, again, a not choice, but uh, I think he's also relevant for representing a type of alternative type of poet from the early time. Uh, finally, in proportion, you could say, as we've already mentioned, this Masters has many more authors but with less poems for each of them. So the comparison, I think, was pretty useful, pretty significant. Okay, so moving on to comparisons, I am also going to compare um, the selections in the 300 Tang poems with two anthologies that I have at home and that I have read. Uh, Sunflower Splendor, which collects uh, 3,000 years of Chinese poetry, 
and the Columbia Anthology of Traditional Chinese Literature by Victor Mea, which collects all sorts of texts. And I'll, I'll be labeling, the, um, labeling them SSCA for ease and uh, brevity. So SS includes a very big section on Tang poetry, it, but it mixes Xi and Zi, so you, you, you have to distinguish and separate them when, when you're looking for reference of things that should have been in uh, 300 Tang poems, because that anthology only includes Xi, so we should take the Zhu out. And uh, uh, CA has one block devoted to Xi poetry, and in that block there are approximately 60 Tang poems. So I think SS is about the same size, a bit bigger. You might have 400 Tang poems, but again, you have to exclude the Zhu. So yeah, it has approximately the same size as Tang poems, whereas um, CA is much smaller, much smaller. Fifth. Now, um, things present, for example, in these two anthologies, which are not present in, in, in masters or in, uh, or in uh, poems, and therefore probably reflect modern day views and modern day tastes, as opposed to traditional views and tastes, are a lot of poems by Li He. He's the main figure, the main absent figure from those two classical collections. But there's also vernacular poetry from Dun Huang, and more female and religiously oriented poetry. So vernacular, uh, vernacular poetry is poetry not written in classical Chinese, popular poetry, most of it hasn't survived, but in the remote desert city of Dunhuang, in, in the early 20th century, a cache or various caches of texts were found, uh, some with, with, with classical Chinese poems, some of them lost, uh, but also others with, you know, with the, pop this type of, the, the, the popular uh, or type of poetry that wouldn't have made it into imperial collections because it wasn't written in in classical Chinese, anyway. But yeah, there are also, uh, the, 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 the elements of modern inclusivity are present in the fact that these anthologies, as I say, try to include more women poets and more uh, unconventional poetry, especially by, by, by Taoists and, uh, and, uh, and Buddhists. But uh, the most important thing I would say is that varying, taking into account these, you know, small details, on the most part, both the proportions of the poets in these anthologies and the choices made are generally similar to Tang poems, which, you know, confirms the, the, the canonicity and uh, the Catholicity of this anthology. Okay, so stretching the net a little bit, uh, going beyond these two anthologies, I have consulted a few others. Um, I have some of them, but in the case of others, I basically checked uh, the, the graphs and tables in a very interesting master's thesis, which you can consult online by Cecilia Chan Chi Man about translations into English of um, Tang poetry. And if you search online with her name in 2017, you will, you will find it. So other translations that I have consulted, um, and especially I, I have checked the tables in, in this thesis. So the Columbia Book of Chinese Poetry by Burton Watson, uh, the Anthology of Chinese Literature by Stephen Owen, Classical Chinese Literature and Anthology of Translations by Lau and Minford, and the Anchor, the Anchor Book of uh, Chinese Poetry by Barnstone, and W.J.B. Fletcher's two volumes on Gems of Chinese Verse. In fact, out of these, uh, of these anthologies, I have read one... I've read uh, two of them, and uh, bits and pieces of others. So I made a big chart comparing all the poets that are included in each of the anthologies, and I, I found the results significant, and they probably will guide the choice of poems and poets I will be including. And uh, just a little bit of, of information. So for example, Chu Guangxi was the only poet that was in all eight translations, that is, in, uh, in uh, CA, Masters, Burton Watson's, Owens's, Lau and Minford's, Barnstone's and Fletcher's. The only anthology from which he is absent is 300 Tang Poems. So he definitely warrants inclusion. Generally, in most anthologies, he only has one or two poems included, but at least one should definitely be in, uh, in an extension of the anthology. With a little bit less, but still very well represented, Han Shan and Li He, present in six of these uh, collections. And as I said earlier, they, are, they, they cater more to the contemporary um, perspective and, and, and tastes in, in classical poetry. Uh, with significant numbers as well, Sikong Tu, Yu Xuanji, who is a woman poet, they have five. Uh, Wanji, Xue Tao, another female poet. Shang Yue, they have four. 
And finally, Jean Rochou, Pierre Richou, Wang Fang Chi, Jia Ji, and Lu Chaolin, they appear in three of these anthologies. So I think I will include poems by all of these authors. Uh, there are other cases which only appear in two or even less of these anthologies, so I probably won't include the majority of them, but I, I, I do feel some, some of them are sufficiently famous uh, as to warrant inclusion, and uh, I will probably include some of the others as well. So, just before passing on to the list, one thing that should be taken into account is that anthologies don't just list the best possible poets, even in the subjective appreciation of the translator. So, and that's a limitation that we have to take into account. So, for example, sometimes, especially in older translations, uh, the, the, the translators choose poems that they feel are easier to translate. And this, we've talked about this when we talked about the relative lack of translations of Li Shangjing in spite of his high critical appreciation, um, because he's a difficult poet to, poet to translate with lots of obscure symbols and references. So, so in some cases, the fact that one poet has been translated and not another does not really reflect just quality between the two, but the fact that one of them, at least in the translator's appreciation, reads better in the translation, is easier to adapt to a foreign language. So that's one thing we should be careful about. Uh, another another thing is that sometimes um, uh, poems will appear in some of these anthologies, not exclusively for the quality, but because there is a translation, because some of these translations are anthologies of translations, which means they need to go to, to translations that already exist. I think this happened a lot in Lao and Minford's book, but also in... in, uh, in, uh, in SS in Sunflower, in Sunflower Splendor. So, so uh, you can find that because some obscure poet was mm, the subject of a doctoral dissertation that was published or of, of some research, there are translations of his available. Other poets that might be just as good didn't have the lack of a doctoral dissertation and therefore have no translations and don't appear in, uh, in different editions. And finally, one last thing we should be careful with is presence by itself is not enough. One should also see the number of poems translated uh, just as I mentioned, Chu, Guangxi generally makes it in all the anthologies, but I think no anthology has more than two or three poems by him. Usually they have one, so so he should be represented, but perhaps another poet who is in less anthologies, like Han Shan, but appears more in contemporary ones, and whenever he appears, he is given you know a lot of space, uh, probably deserves more space as well. Okay, so finally, making amends, here are the two provisional classes from which I will be taking poems, and I divide them into two groups. The first group is the excluded, so they are figures that were not included at all in 300 Tang poems and should have been. And these fall into five classes. The first class is a man into itself, it's Li He. Li He was a very interesting high Tang poet, I think high Tang mid Tang, with a very unfortunate career. He didn't manage to pass the Jin Shi, he had a big impoverished family and he died very young. And he was a bit of an unorthodox poet in subject matter, dwelling in, in, in subject matter that probably felt indecorous or inappropriate by the most orthodox Confucian scholars, like ghosts, cemeteries, um, supernatural elements, very obscure imagery as well. He's very romantic, uh, or proto-romantic, we would say. So he definitely should be included, and uh, it's, it's really an unacceptable oversight. Or, but generally based on, on different uh, aesthetical criteria in those anthologies that, uh, that I've mentioned before. So Li He should be represented in probably with at least seven, eight, nine, or ten poems. So next in line, women poems. So well, well, let, let me make a caveat. You know, I am not a fanatic of inclusivity. Like, uh, there's a very interesting article by Gayatri Chakravati Spiva, or Can the Subaltern Speak, in which one of the points she makes is that even if we want to correct history. History has taken place and we cannot change it. Like, we cannot speak for those subaltern people who never wrote or whose works were destructed in the past. And even if we want to um, avenge or make justice, you know, the, the past cannot be undone. Now, when we talk about uh, Tang poetry, almost the, the vast majority of that poetry is, was written by male. Some poetry was written by females, uh, not that much. But the one that was the ones that were written by by females generally were written by you know by the sing-song girls of the pleasure quarters, 
Their poems are thematically very restricted. They generally always laugh poems, generally quatrains, which are simpler to make. And, you know, this is a reality. We cannot change this. So it's not like there's like a, a, an Emily Dickinson of Tang poetry that, 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 that has been uh, by, marginalized by a conspiracy of, 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 of wicked Chinese scholars and that we should rescue her. No, actually most of the uh, poems of, 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 of the anthologies deserve a, the, their place on top of some of the poems of the women poets that, I am, that I'm mentioning here. But I do have a certain... But, but Chinese traditional society was a bit misogynistic Probably the women poets that there were were un, unfairly excluded in the anthology, so probably they should have made a bigger appearance than they make. So I am going to try to compensate for that, and uh, those are uh, I will include poems by at least those uh, five poets there: Xue Tao, Xu Yu, Xuan Di. They're the most famous ones. Li Jie, Xia Guan Wan Er, and Xu Hui. Another sector we talked about it that was. Uh, relatively marginalized, is uh, monk poets, probably because, you know, scholar official poetry was made by scholar officials. This also explains the lack of, 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 of regulated poems on the most part by women. You know, those training in that sort of poetry was what a scholar official did to become a scholar official. Uh, monk poets are discriminated probably for religious reasons, like, like, like uh, too explicitly Buddhist or poetry is probably felt as inappropriate by Confucian score officials, and it's generally excluded from the anthologies. I think, especially the two first poets there, Guan Xu, Qi Yi, should be represented, even though a case can be made for the fact that they're very late Tang poets. In fact, most of their production is made in the Five Dynasties, but anyway, I'll probably be including a few poems of, of them. Yet another category is poets in the vernacular, and this connects with the Dong Huan manuscript. So Han Shang and uh, Wang Fangxi, also translated as Brahma Karin Wang, or Wang the Zealot. Uh, these are probably not individuals. The collections of poetry ascribed to these two are, are probably, were, they were probably written by a lot of different monks. They share style and subject matter. They are pretty coarse, direct Buddhist poetry within the vernacular. So because of being the vernacular, they would automatically have no place in an anthology of classical Chinese poetry, but they are she. And... Uh, uh, the, they are examples of something that doesn't usually happen, which is, but, but which does happen from time to time, which is minor figures in language in literature A become very important in language B when they are translated. So this is unusual. Generally, the, the canonical status and proportions of appreciation of, of writers in one literature uh, continue in the translations of that literature to another literature, but there are some cases with exceptions. So, for example, in English, uh, the very, the most famous case probably is Omar Hayam. Omar Hayam is a very important Persian Middle Ages intellectual, but he wasn't especially appreciated as a poet. Like he was way beyond the critical appreciation of, of I don't know, of, of Hafiz or of, 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 of uh, the author of Haftar, and, you know, of, 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 of the Shah Dames, Field Uh so he was a Persian, as a poet, he wasn't appreciated much in Persian. But because he found in Fitzgerald in the 19th century a very good translator uh, who also adapted that poetry to the tastes of Victorian literature, he became a classic in English. Like in English, you have the Rubaiyat of Omar Hayyam translated by Fitzgerald. It's an English literature classic. So he has a disproportionate importance in English, which he does not have in Persian. The same thing happens in the West with Han Shan. Han Shan's Buddhist poetry became very popular through some American translations in the 50s uh, in the context of the big mix. I think Gary Snyder was the main figure here. And, you know, Americans fell in love with, with Han Shan. And he is the most translated uh, Tang Dynasty poet, closely following the footsteps of, of Du Fu and, and, and the greatest of the canon. So, so in English, translations of Chinese poetry, Han Shan occupies, you know, like he's in the top five, if, if not in the top three. So he should be included, definitely. Uh, a fourth section, well, actually it's a fifth. I'm seeing a number mistake here. This is the fifth, and this would be the sixth. So the fifth group of excluded people are poets who excelled in different forms, not in the Xi form. So this happens a lot. Uh, Xi was the main literary form, or the most prestigious one in the Tang, but there were others. The Zhu was uh, appearing, especially in the second half of the Tang, uh, 
Uh, and previous forms like the Fu, the prosimetric prose poem, were also very popular and they were still mandated in the exams. This anthology is an anthology of Xi, so it is, excludes other poets. But I think at least two that I appreciate a lot, Lu Chaoling and Zhang Zhong, very important early Tang poets, should be included. Uh, they, both of them, excelled in Fu, but they have probably some Xi that might be included in, in the selection uh, to recognize their literary merit. Finally, uh, 1.6 would be other poets, probably some of those that appeared in the previous slide, those that appear in a lot of anthologies, but not in 300 Tang poems. And finally, to conclude, those were the excluded, but there are some poets that are represented in 300 Tang poems, but could be better represented than they are. Uh, probably, at least in my estimation, the number of poems they have in the anthology does not match up with the current critical appraisal of their value. So they're, they're there, but they're in the wrong proportions. So the underrepresented would first be, first of all, Bai Juji. Bai Juji arguably would be the most important mid-Tang poet. And I think he has, I don't know if it's six or seven, maybe nine at most poems in the anthology. He should have at least four or five more. Like, he's one of the great names. And, and not only was he important in the mid-Tang, a lot of his poems have been preserved, and he was the most popular Tang poet in out of China, in, that is, in, in already in 9th century um, Korea. In Japan, he was, you know, top of the podium. There's even no dramas that include him as a protagonist. And also the selections of, po of his poems in the, in the anthology. He wrote about a lot of topics, but he's especially famous for his Xin Jui Fu, and none of those are represented in in 300 Tang poems, I feel. So Bai Yuji definitely has to have some of his poems included. Meng Jiao. Meng Jiao, we also talked about this when, when, we, when we presented him. He is a very dark, sad, depressive poet because, you know, he had a very unhappy life, bad luck with the examinations, his wife and children died. You know, he is a very depressing read at times. And, but he is a very good poet. And, uh, you know, Stephen Owen has a book dedicated to his poetry, and Han Yu's. He is a very important mid-Tang poet and uh, famously lambasted, among others, by Su Xi for his coldness and, uh, and, and, and leanness. But uh, I think he should probably have more of those poems that are more representative of his style included in, the, in, the, in this series. Number three, Jiao Rang. He's a Buddhist monk, like number four, Jia Dao, who was an ex-Buddhist monk. Again, they suffer from the, probably from the relative marginalization of Buddhist poetry, but they're both very important poets of the high tang and of the mid tang, so they probably need to be included as well. Chen Zhuang. Chen Zhuang is a very important po poet of the early tang. He has a series of poems, I think they're called the Ganju series, uh, about my intimate thoughts or about my feelings, that are very obscure uh, poetry in the style of uh, third century poet Ruanji. Uh, those poems have been read allegorically as criticism of, of, of Empress Wu, Zhu Tian, and they are his most famous, and probably some of those should be included in the anthology. Finally, uh, Wen Ting Yun and Han Yu. So Wen Ting Yun, um, he's a very important poet as a Zhu poet. He's the great father of that genre. We can't include Zhu poems, but he has a lot of Xi poetry as well. So maybe a couple of poems of his are warranted. And finally, Han Yu. Han Yu is a very central figure in the Chinese literary tradition, more in the prose than in the poetry, but he is, you know, he was the father of the Ku Wen movement, uh, which, which led to a decisive intellectual change in literature and later in philosophy uh, in classical China. He was the precursor of those Sang Dynasty changes towards a different type of prose and uh, a different, uh, uh, more sh slightly xenophobic, more Confucian-centered uh, kind of civilization and culture. And, you know, he was the father of all this. And uh, he was a prolific writer mm, and of prose and poetry, and probably he deserves at least a couple of poems more. And I think that will be it. I hope you will enjoy the new poems. <laughs>